An area has a finite carrying capacity. This is the number of animals or people that can live there indefinitely. If a species overshoots the carrying capacity of that area, it will die back until the population returns to its natural limits. The world has avoided this die-off by finding new lands to cultivate or by increasing production, which has been possible largely thanks to oil. To continue growth, more resources are required than the Earth can provide, but no new planets are available. In the face of all these challenges, global food production must double by 2050 to feed the growing world population. One billion people are already malnourished or starving. There will be challenges in feeding over nine billion in the years to come, when world oil and natural gas production will be in decline. The global economy grows exponentially at about 3% a year, consuming increasing amounts of non-renewable fuels, minerals and metals, as well as renewable resources like water, forests, soils and fish faster than they can be replenished. Even at a growth rate of 1%, an economy will double in 70 years. The problem is intensified by other factors. Globalization allows people on one continent to buy goods and food made by those on another. The lines of supply are long, placing strains on a limited oil resource. We now rely on distant countries for basic necessities. Modern cities are fossil fuel dependent. Most banking systems are based on debt, forcing people into a spiral of loans and repayments, producing growth. What can be done in the face of these problems? Many believe that the crisis can be prevented through conservation, technology, smart growth, recycling, electric cars and hybrids, substitution or voting. Conservation will save you money, but it alone won't save the planet. If some people cut back on oil use, the reduced demand will drive down the price, allowing others to buy it for less. In the same fashion, a more efficient engine that uses less energy will, paradoxically, lead to greater energy use. In the 19th century, English economist William Stanley Jevons realized that better steam engines made coal a more cost-effective fuel source, which led to the use of more steam engines, which increased total coal consumption. Growth of use will consume any energy or resource saved through conservation. Many believe that scientists will solve these problems with new technology. However, technology is not energy. Technology can channel energy into work, but it can't replace it. It also consumes resources. For instance, computers are made with one-tenth of the energy needed to make a car. More advanced technologies may make the situation worse, as many require rare minerals, which are also approaching limits. For example, 97% of the world's rare earths are produced by China, most from a single mine in Inner Mongolia. These minerals are used in catalytic converters, aircraft engines, high efficiency magnets and hard drives, hybrid car batteries, lasers, portable x-rays, shielding for nuclear reactors, compact discs, hybrid vehicle motors, low energy light bulbs, fiber optics, and flat-screen displays. China has begun restricting the export of these minerals as demand soars. So-called sustainable growth, or smart growth, won't help as it also uses non-renewable metals and minerals in ever-increasing quantities, including rare earths. Recycling will not solve the problem as it requires energy and the process is not 100% efficient. It is only possible to reclaim a fraction of the material being recycled. A large portion is lost forever as waste. Electric cars run on electricity. As most power is generated from fossil fuels, this is not a solution. Also, 
Cars of all types consume oil in their production. Each tire alone requires about seven gallons of petroleum. There are around 800 million cars in the world as of 2010. At current growth rates, this number would reach 2 billion by 2025. It is unlikely that the planet can support this many vehicles for long, regardless of their power source. Many economists believe that the free market will substitute one energy source with another through technological innovation. However, the main substitutes to oil face their own decline rates. Substitution also fails to account for the time needed to prepare for a transition. The US Department of Energy's Hirsch report estimates that at least two decades would be needed to prepare for the effects of peak oil. The issues of energy shortages, resource depletion, topsoil loss, and pollution are all symptoms of a single, larger problem. Growth. As long as our financial system demands endless growth, reform is unlikely to succeed. What then will the future look like? Optimists believe that growth will continue forever, without limits. Pessimists think that we're heading towards a new stone age or extinction. The truth may lie between these extremes. It is possible that society might fall back to a simpler state, one in which energy use is a lot less. This would mean a harder life for most, more manual labor, more farm work, and local production of goods, food, and services. What should a person do to prepare for such a possible future? Expect a decrease in supplies of food and goods from faraway places. Start walking or cycling. Get used to using less electricity. Get out of debt. Try to avoid banks. Instead of shopping at big box stores, support local businesses. Buy food grown locally at farmers markets. Instead of a lawn, consider gardening to grow your own food. Learn how to preserve it. Consider the use of local currencies, should the larger economy cease to function, and develop greater self-sufficiency. None of these steps will prevent collapse, but they might improve your chances in a low energy future, one in which we will have to be more self-reliant as our ancestors once were. <laughs>